Do you think the higher profit potentials of large U.S. companies in domestic markets will continue at the expense of foreign and new domestic competitors? Well, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that because th these old dichotomies really don't exist anymore. We know that half of the revenues and half of the earnings of U.S. corporations come from non-U.S. sources. And uh, so we, you already have an international fund there. And the question, I mean, let's call it 50 percent. It's different. You don't have the same currency problems and all that, um, or currency value variations if you own foreign stocks. And by the way, I should say this. I don't know how many people know it, uh, but I, I want to have a chance to mention it. And as last year, uh, there is no question, I'm glad Mel didn't ask one, there's no question that gets asked more of me than why don't I favor international stocks. And I've explained it over and over and over again. And now when somebody asks it, I say, I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well be honest. But last year, uh, this, this year that we're going through right now, uh, foreign stocks have done exactly the same, non-U.S. stocks have done exactly the same as U.S. stocks, up about 14%, until you get the weakness in the U.S. dollar, which has added 10% to those returns, so when you look at the international returns and non-U.S. returns, you will see 24%. But understand that those things are not fundamental in local currency terms, the way the markets are actually performing before you get into currency, is, um, is identical. So there are a lot of things that go into this. Now, I always thought currency risk was a, was a, a reason not to own international or non-U.S. funds. But I don't really object to it. And, but it's gotten to the point I think the article was on CNBC, maybe, Mike, the thing about my feelings on international. And it, it, oh, you didn't see that. Yeah, I was wondering. It's six pages, six pages <laughs> of um, explaining my international position. And, it, you know, it's very logical. Could be wrong. I'm not saying that. You can always be wrong. Uh, but it points out that I don't tell you don't, don't need to own them. You just be aware of these risks. A lot of returns in the, the U.S. companies are already international companies. Um, that uh, currency risk is a big thing. That institutional kind of risk. And these are how these things change. I'm not allowed to get into politics, but the fact of the matter is we used to look at the United States as having the strongest institutions in the world, governmental institutions, court institutions, or, or, or other kinds of institutions that change our lives here for the better every day. And... Uh, you know, the, gov the government institution is shaky today. Everybody knows that. Uh, I used to ask, have we lost one of the risks? Is our, will we lose the ability to govern ourselves? You know, I think you could argue that we're giving that a good shot. Um, but that's politics, so I won't pursue it. He says, in Bogle uh, on mutual funds, you explain why international investing has risks and state that perhaps investors should keep their money in U.S. stocks. It concerns me that virtually no other passive investing author is worried about the same risk that you identify. Why do you think these risks are ignored and international investing is being touted as crucial for maximum diversity? What is behind this? <laughs> well, first, I have never given a damn about what anybody else thinks. We knew that, John. <laughs> <laughs> and I pay attention and I listen to the arguments. Now, that may be a little strong form of my feeling, but uh, they're entitled to their opinion, and it may be right. And as this article in, is, that I just cited mentions, and then this is true, I say this uh, whenever I write about it. Uh, that, that when I first said this, you don't need any international, any non-U.S. stocks. It was 1994 in my first book. I was on the record. You don't need them if, you, if you're going to have them because of these extra risks. Stop at 20 percent, no matter what the market weight is. And so in the next 20 years, 25 years almost, in the non-U.S. are up about, let me say, 300 percent, and the U.S. is up 800 percent. So this is a brilliant prognostication. I hear a little applause there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yet uh, I quickly acknowledge the fact that the U.S. has done so well for so long in this relative sense may, mean, may easily mean that we'll have some reversion to the mean. I always talk about that. And it could mean that. One doesn't really know. So to, you know, just take all of the, don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Take, you know, make your own decisions. But I, I do think uh, that you don't want to get carried away with 
with uh, unknown risks. And then, then I use this other example, and they talk about this thing. And that is, when you talk about non-US, think about what non-US means. Don't just take it as, as it's for granted. The largest non-US market is the United Kingdom, the second is Japan, and the third is France. Now, the UK, with Brexit and all, is not a particularly productive economy. I would bet that our GDP would grow faster than theirs in the next 25 years. Japan, very structured society, population shrinking, or aging population, uh, tsunamis every few years, <laughs> uh, doesn't seem to me to be a, a place that will do better than the US. And France, my God, they don't go to work there. They're having a big fight again. <laughs> So, oh. <laughs> if you're French, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but they have, they, they have very strong labor protections in France, there's no question about this. And the idea of the new Macron, I guess, administration is to reduce those protections and have a more competitive framework. And labor is revolting. Uh, you know, they, they have a, I think it's a 35 hour maximum week or something like that. And. Uh, Thank God I work 35 hours and a half a week. <laughs> Not now, but I used to. Well, Jack, given your views on your opinions on uh, international investing, can you give us a little background, the uh, history of how Total International came about? Well, I started the International Fund because I thought there was a definite place for international in the mutual fund industry among investors who want international exposure. And... Uh, did I think it through in the same way I do today? I mean, I didn't think whether it would help them or hurt them. I thought it was a viable option. And, you know, <laughs> it really is funny that the uh, we started off before we got to the International Index Fund. Uh, we just started to internationalize the old IVEST fund, that fund that failed so badly. And we divided it into an international portfolio, 50%, and the U.S. portfolio, 50%. And the year after we did that, the international portfolio went up. 100%. Brilliant. No. Luck. Luck. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's 100% in a year. It's amazing. And uh, you can check it in your little prospectus or something. You check me, Mike. But I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, and uh, But it was a very large number. But I, it's, a, it's a legitimate option for those who want it. I just don't think everybody should have it built into their, into their uh, investment objectives. And I think you should understand what you're doing and what you're getting. And the one thing I say about international is, and this is all such common sense. I mean, I feel like I'm revealing the secrets of the world uh, behind the curtain. But before you do anything on the international, look at the international index. Well, the largest company in the international index is Great Britain. The second largest is Japan. And the third largest is France. Britain, Japan, and France. They're probably, let me take a guess, at 23 or 4% of the total international index. I don't think Britain's doing so well. They don't even know what they're going to do about the so-called Brexit. They're still struggling with even, they've never even voted to, to, to actually do it. The parliament is going to have to do that someday or go back for another vote, which I think is highly unlikely. Uh, but they, they have a troubled economy. They have this total question about the exit from the European Union. They have the, li the likelihood that if they do that, Scotland will break off and the United Kingdom will only have one kingdom, Britain. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it, it, it doesn't seem like the best of the place you'd want a big hunk of your money. Now, I could be wrong and that. Valuations may be good, but kind of when you look at it in this way, Japan, my God, they've got the worst demographics in the world. Well, Lowest ratio of probably about one to one of uh, workers uh, to retirees, raising the question of what happens to the last in the U.S. What happens to the last Social Security recipient when the last um, employer dies? <laughs> this would be a problem, and uh, and the and then there's they get a to tsunami periodically and a very, very structured economy, and very, very structured culture. Uh, I'm just not so sure that's going to be a good place to invest, struggling economically a lot, one prime minister after another. 
They don't seem to be able to find the answer. And then there's France. They don't work in France. <laughs> well, that may be a little hyperbole, but they sure take the summer off. And uh, it doesn't seem like... And they strike a lot. Yeah. And, and, and Germany seems to be doing a good job. They're fourth. Um, but I only wanted to make my point by using the three bad ones. But uh, you, are, you are owning countries. And to accept the index without knowing what's big, S&P 500, for example, we all know how totally dominated it's been in recent years by the Googles and the Alphabets and the whatevers, um, and uh, Microsoft a little bit now, things like that as compared to the conventional leaders, uh, Exxon, I'm not having a very good time either for a whole lot of reasons. So uh, we don't really know how to deal with all that, except that these are very highly valued stocks compared to, uh, compared, maybe not compared to their prospects, but compared to the leaders years ago. So, uh, but it's still, just to come back to our friend Arnott, and I mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again. Okay, they've had 19 years to do it, and they can't do it. Uh, he and Jeremy Siegel together. Uh, a little higher reward and a little lower reward, respectively. A little higher risk and a little lower risk, res respectively. And a sharp ratio risk-adjusted return that's a little lower than the S&P 500. They haven't proven anything, and they've had 19 years of business between the two of them to prove it. And that's not good enough for me. But they prove it in advance. You can. This is a great business. You can prove anything in advance. Um, but will it happen? Read the articles in the Financial Analyst Journal by the professors. And they've got these formulas or oh, head over heels, and they're incomprehensible to me. But they come and they go. It's just not a profitable thing to do. Bill Sharp, by the way, said, smart beta is stupid. <laughs> that was his contribution to the debate, which is good enough for me.